Our next match, we're going to head over to the Minimum Competitive Concept Competition in Houston. So for those of you who aren't familiar, the MCC is a term that was, um, I think, Ike um, from the Killer Bees, uh, now a lead robot inspector, was the first one to come up with this term. And it basically refers to what's the minimum a robot can do in a given season while still maintaining a competitive level. And I think there was, there was more analysis to it, but it's basically like, hey, let's build a robot that can still contribute to alliances in a useful way, but let's make it as simple as possible. And the folks on 118 um, have taken it a couple steps further, where the last two years they've released a robot like this, but they've also in made a challenge to themselves that the robot can cost no more than $1,000, and we're talking 1,000 re real dollars, not bill of material dollars, but one th yeah, 1,000 actual dollars and they release full plans out there. So they, these, any team could have this robot right now. And it's done by some of their alumni, I believe, and some of their current students. But it's just like really, like last year's robot, um, the EveryBot, um, as I'm calling it, EveryBot 2018, was basically just like a shovel or like a bucket, a, a bucket that could reverse slam a jam of them into the switch. And it was super, super effective. And then there were teams who like combined it with like a shovel to make a shove kit and were great. And so... It's really interesting to see what you can do with such simple robots. And last year they held a competition for this, and it actually was really interesting because it revealed a lot of strategy um, about the game. And we're going to take a look at one of these right now. And so it's not the most exciting match. There's only two robots on the field. We've got a EveryBot 2018 and an EveryBot 2019. But it does show a little bit about how cycles are going to play out in this match and uh, what's going on. So we're going to take a look at it here. Uh, just give me one second. I am now ready. So again, two robots in this match, and let's go back to the start of. Uh, I'm going to call this auto, but we know it's the sandstorm period. But something very interesting happens in the sandstorm period. So let's go. And I'm going to pause right now, because all the robots were moving in auto. I mean, this is just not something you would expect for an RI 3D competition. It never usually happens in weeks one, two, three of the season, but this year. It absolutely will. So say what you want about the sandstorm period and the lack of a true autonomous mode. It is going to result in more robots moving, which is a good thing for anyone who's watching and for competitors. But it also means that teams like you need to have a plan for auto. It's not just like I just need to drive forward. You need to have a plan of what you want to do. And we see every bot 2019 in the white bumpers. They have a plan. They're going to take their one hatch panel and they're going to try and score it. So let's take a look. They turn, they drive, they get lined up pretty quickly considering they're, they can't see their robot and they score that panel eventually, eventually. There we go, pause. Let's pause right here again. Now, I know this is Sandstorm, they couldn't really see, but this gives you an example of how long it takes to line up these panels when you're scoring them. But also, that's a great Sandstorm move. If you can just score one panel during the sandstorm, you are incredibly useful to your alliance. And it's interesting that that's one of the harder panel locations to score on. The easiest ones, or the straightforward ones, are the ones that are straight ahead on the front of the rocket, which I assume those are the bays that most uh, teams who typically struggle with auto are going to be trying to do. But here they have to make, they have to go straight and they have to be able to turn. And they're very blind. If you're behind the alliance class, it's really hard to see what's going on there. So that's a hard move. Well, of course, it's hard to see going, what's going on there because they can't see. It's the sandstorm. Good. I have to get used to that. But auto, scoring, scoring in auto is something that teams are pretty much going to have to do to be able to contribute usefully to an elimination alliance this year. It's not in the past where you can just get away with crossing the line. And so teams out there who are just like, oh, Forget about trying to drive the robot. I want to do a true autonomous in the, during the sandstorm. That's a great goal. I admire you for doing that because there's a lot your students can learn by doing true autonomous. But when you get to a competition, unless you can consistently score one game piece, you need to switch to driver control if you want to keep up. Now, if you want to keep going through the challenge, then, hey, that's your life, man. So, like, just, just live it to the best you can. Uh, let's go on into this match and take a look as uh, the manual clearing of the cargo base. I wish this was a part of the real game because that would be hilarious. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right, and we watch the cargo roll. And there we go, into uh, teleoperated mode. And I want you to watch uh, the Black Bumpers, Everybody 2018. They're, like, really good. 
for a <laughs> robot that wasn't designed to play this game. They're just going to pick up balls from the human player and they score them pretty easily. And they actually end up doing five cycles in this match. So that should say a lot about what's going on. Next, let's take a look in the white bumpers, um, our EveryBot 2019. Just follow them around the field and how much time it takes them to line up on every cycle. They get to the loading station. They have to line up. Now they're coming back. The drive time is short, but there is a pause as they get lined up to score each panel. And we see that. And so let's pause again right here. And I want to talk about this. The dreams of the 10-second cycles. If you want to do a 10-second cycle, which is, is possible, do them consistently throughout the match, that maybe. But if you want to do it, it's not about speeding up your drive time. It's about alignment for intake and alignment for ejection. And uh, there was a great post on Chief by Jonathan Norris from Team 610. Uh, most of you guys, well, actually, I know him as Jano. And they really broke down on ways you can improve your cycle time, really focusing on those two key portions of the cycle, the uh, game piece acquisition and game piece release. And I take, I really recommend the teams look at it. But anything you can do... so. Some of the things you can do is a lot of teams have been talking about using sensors to help align, using the camera to help align. That's great. But mechanical alignment devices. So you could just slam in and you got that piece. That's super important. Making sure once you've got the game piece, it stays centered on your robot or in, within your intake. So then your camera can do that work. Because if the game piece doesn't rest consistently in the same spot on your robot, whatever you do with the camera is not going to be useful. So self-centering discs, making sure the balls self-center. So they're not on the, if you have a wide intake, which a lot of teams are going to have, how are you getting that ball to the center? These are the sorts of things that can speed up your cycle. And I thought every bot um, did a nice job with this, but this is stuff to remember. So when you watch these matches, you may say, well, I'm not going to ever do an every bot. I'm not going to do an MCC. So like, why does these matches matter to me? They matter because they show you the flow of the matches and where time can be shaved off. So if you want to be fast, if you want those, killer cycles you need to figure out how to shave time and you can learn a lot by watching these matches so let's keep going and i mean like in my notes i say lining up to load panels is a pain lining up to score panels is a pain like it is just a thing uh something else that is a bit of a pain is there's cargo everywhere let's pause right now see and uh, pj this is what i want you to watch right mm -hmm. in front of um every bot 2019 they are trying to score in that bay there is a piece of cargo sitting right in front of it Mm -hmm. So I want you to watch this interaction and tell me if this is legal. Because they have a panel in the robot. They go out there, they move, they turn, the ball turns with them, and then they score the panel. PJ, you make the call. Uh, if I'm making the call on the field with the rules as I understand them right now, I call that as possession of the second game piece. And Okay, let's talk about this, guys. Yeah, and, like I said, like, I, this I, is I'm going to throw a disclaimer on here. Let's not throw PJ to the wolves here. Uh, <laughs> even though he looks like a mountain man. <laughs> like, you know, because he's making his interpretation as he understands the rules right now. This, we are not the official Q&A. PJ's not the official Q&A. This might be... You know, referee training hasn't even happened. PJ's just using his best knowledge of being a referee for how, like, seven years now? Uh, 2011 was my first year. Yeah, so, like, this is his ninth season of refing. Um, thank you, PJ. So, but what we just saw there, let's back it up, Tyler, so we can see that again. Because this is going to happen all the time. Yeah. So that first ball, that's that it. one, I'd probably be okay with because it kind of just like floats away as they hit it. That one, I think, I don't think that's a call. Okay, but for what it's worth. Watch here. And <laughs> this one. Here's, so here's the thing they've turned it, they've moved it, they turn it, and they push it again. There's like two different turning motions i think that's where the call comes in my head is they push it like to the left kind of and then they spin it around and push it farther away from the cargo ship you know towards us the viewer and i think it's that second motion that makes me call it a possession so pj now put your strategist hat hat on drive coach yes. hat <laughs> if you're giving advice to your team going out let's pause the action here for a bit if you're going to give advice to your team and you know the cargo is always going to be in the way. How would you tell them to deal with that situation if they I, are the everybody? I tell them to hit that cargo as hard as they can to just like knock it off in one motion, or not do that. Like if they would have just sort of nudged it to the side and then scored, I think it would have been a no call. It's the turnaround where they pushed it towards you know like us, the viewer. 
for lack of a better term. That's that's where I think the call happens is that second movement. And I, I mean, to, to, to put this in terms of soccer, you want you're basically you want to go in there and you just want to kick the ball as opposed to dribbling the ball. So you don't want to just fiddle around with it. You just want to put your foot on it and just boom, send it out of the way. And these balls will fly. So, yeah. but I, I think what's going to happen a lot is in that case. They could have come in with a velocity and they could have set that ball flying, but it would have probably gone to the other side of the field. And there's going to be teams who don't want to do that. Yes. And that's why they want to do these delicate motions. But that's how you can get in trouble with these penalties. So let's let this go. 830 with the, uh, you got to hit it and quit it, as he said. Very nice. Let's keep watching here. Although there's, there's not, there's not much else that happens throughout this match. So we can just kind of talk over it as it happens. But, um, we, we know the cargo is going to be in the way. Um, the everybot, uh, 2018 like i just I, I hope that robot can play every game forever and just people <laughs> just keep putting it out there because it is it is so simple and just like that one joint over the back reverse slamma jamma like it's just it's that, so that robot is gonna be better than 50 percent of the robots in the field at least week one for sure <laughs> oh I, you know i long live the shove kit the shove kit was <laughs> team up 5704 up here in canada and they took the every bot and they modified it so we had a ground the shovel could go all the way down to the ground to pick up cubes so it was like a shovel and a bucket so it's like a shove kit and they were just so good and they made me so happy (laughs) but um they you know if you so one thing we're going to see here is that in this match everybody 2019 does seven cycles everybody 2018 does five cycles and so you're thinking it's like oh wow like if these robots can do this many cycles like that how many could we possibly do there's a huge advantage to only having two robots on the field there's a lot less clutter even just having three robots on the same alliance in this amount of space it's, it's going to be really hard to maneuver. There's not much space to get around each other. Teams are going to be constantly in the way of their partner. So it's going to take a lot of flow. I think that came up a little bit in the RI3D match we watched earlier, where those there was definitely some robots. I mean, one was stuck on the platform for most of the match, but they were definitely getting each other's ways a little bit. So one thing that I think teams need to watch out for is I, I, one prediction I almost want to make. There's been a tendency over the last few years in FRC is there's been more shared practice fields out there the teams who are more likely to pick a team that they share a practice field with because they jive well on the field and they've worked and they've orchestrated things. That's really important this year because of the, and this was kind of in play in 2011 when the scoring zones got a little bit tighter for the rack where you were working in close quarters to finish a logo. And I remember uh, Waterloo that year, 11, 14 and 20, 56 were just so smooth weaving in and out because they had practiced so much together. I think there's a real advantage for teams who've worked together before because man space is tight the other thing is and um a lot of people have been talking about what's the better optimal strategy this year three robots on offense or two robots on offense one robot on defense and one of the things about sending a robot down to play defense is now there's four robots on their side of the field if they don't react to you well there's only two on your side of the field and so that extra space so it's not just the defender is slowing them down that robot is opening up opportunities for the two scoring robots on that alliance so there's there a lot of people have said oh there's not much strategy in this game but i there is when you think about these sorts of things it's not as crazy strategic of i mean last year where you're every cube that you were placing had optimal marginal value in a different location it's not that intense but there's still a lot of stuff going on and i think as the game develops we're gonna see and at the higher levels we're definitely gonna see stuff like that where it's you talked about earlier the uh, the checkers game of where you place the uh, hatches, the um, the when when you cut and run to play defense, if you cut and run to play defense. These kinds of things might not be super relevant week one, but come champs time, they're gonna be. Yeah, no, this is this is neat. Hey guys, I just want to point out uh, we have on on screen from uh, Ethan from one eighteen. If you guys didn't see this, uh, uh, they actually filmed. This is the exact same match that we were just breaking down in analysis. Uh, from behind the glass perspective as well, too. So a great thing. And something, uh, Karthik and PJ, I don't know if you've seen the beginning of what the sandstorm period looks like, but they do a really great job showing off uh, what this process is like and and how it runs through this way. So uh, so I don't know if you had an opportunity to see this, but if anybody else, uh, I know uh, Ethan put the link in, in chat there, but go check out this video because this is really, really cool. They get background on what what this looks like and what the field looks like from perspective as well too. And I really hope the sandstorm blinds go up faster than that. It's this which whose YouTube channel is this hosted on, so people can find it afterwards. People who are watching the archive and won't be able to click and chat. Okay, 
yeah, for those of you who are watching this uh, not live, look, head over to Ethan Reed's YouTube channel to find this video. So, I think so we have the, the matches are archived on Fun's channel, but but these in particular are on Ethan Reed. So make sure you go check those out. Yeah, uh, th this is some I haven't seen this before, so this is really cool and informative stuff. So that's that's but what awesome. Tyler brings up a good point about the curtains for the sandstorm. That's been a uh, concern. Is I believe it says in the manual that they don't guarantee they're going to go up at the same speed every time or that all three are going to go up at the same speed from each other. So that's just something to keep in mind as we yeah. move on with life. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that, that's the thing that I'm not going to comment on. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we've watched these MCC matches. We've watched the RI3D match. And I think what you see here is like, again, seven cycles, five cycles for these teams. There's a lot of value in going simple this year. And there's a lot of value going simple every year. Lots of teams aren't going to take that advice, but that those who do will profit from it. Because especially early on in the season, you can do a lot. And, I mean, this is talking bigger picture, looking into 2020, but I think going forward, we're going to see a lot of teams who come out of the gate with a simpler robot with plans to keep developing throughout the season with something more complicated. And I think that this year is a, would be an interesting place for someone to try that because I think you can really go to a week one, two, or three district event with a simple low-scoring bot and do some damage. Um, the other thing about the SMC video, and you're seeing it from um, the video that Ethan posted, is the value of having a dash cam, um, how important it is, and how it's it's not that hard to implement, especially um, WPI Lib on Screen Steps Live has a great set of instructions on how to use the Microsoft Life Cam for this year for these purposes. So. That's something that teams should really be looking into as well. There's a lot of stuff going on here, but um, we need your help to keep fun at loud, live, and independent. Help us by visiting our Patreon to pledge your support at patreon.com forward slash first updates now. You can also support fun live on Twitch for a few bucks a month or by linking your Prime account for free and clicking subscribe. Thank you to all of our co-executive producers keeping fun loud, live, and independent. Pledge your support at patreon.com forward slash first updates now.